Yeah, so I'm going to show you how I ended up building a container runtime, which is, is kind of a weird thing to do. But my hope is um, that you'll learn a lot, right? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story, how this came to be, that I spent some time building a container runtime, which is going to end up going a little bit into Unix history. Um, and then I'll show you the code for building the runtime, learn a little bit about some Linux stuff, uh, some syscalls. Uh, but the whole point is I want you to understand what containers really are when you peel back the layers, right? I, I love this uh, XKCD comic, and it, it, I, I love it because it hurts, because it, it kind of points to a problem where sometimes you use tools, but you don't really understand what they're doing, and it just feels like magic. Um, so why not peel back the layers, spend some time, understand what's happening uh, underneath the covers. So that's um, what I hope that you'll leave this with, it is not how to build your own container runtime, although yes, you'll get that, but more just like what is really going on with containers. So what is a container runtime, right? There are a whole bunch of different container runtimes. Uh, the simplest, I was thinking of there's like a gradient of complexity and, and the, the simplest, smallest one that, that's used a lot is, is run C. And, and run C is very simple. You can't use run C easily to, to grab a, a Docker container from Docker Hub and start it up. It's, it's a little bit lower level than that. Um, next up from that, there's container D, uh, which, you know, it can start up uh, OCI images. It can start up Docker images and, and run them. Um, past that, there's lots of things that call themselves container runtimes, um, such as Kata containers, and uh, you can run containers inside of Firecracker VMs. You don't have to know what any of this is, by the way, but um, those are sort of like VMs. They're, they're not truly container runtimes. They're, they're using VM infrastructure to run containers. Um, but there's this whole spectrum of how complex things can be, and we're going to be a little bit more on the left side, closer to run C, maybe a little bit towards container D. Um, but that's what a container runtime is. Like if you, if you have an OCI image, right, it's, it's something at rest. It's like a binary. When you start it up and it's running, then it becomes a container, right? And the thing that does that starting up and starts it running, that is the runtime. Um, but another interesting way that'll become relevant for this talk to think about containers uh, and runtimes is on an absurdity spectrum, right? <laughs> so there is, container D is very non-absurd. Um, using Podman, using Docker, like that, that's a very normal thing to do. A very absurd way to run containers is this project called Bocker that somebody built, and that's a full uh, implementation of most of the Docker CLI, written all in Bash, and I guess it's like, 200 lines of bash, um, which doesn't sound like very much, but when you open it, you will see that that is a very dense code. It's just like a lot of pipes happening. Uh, I could not understand it. But what we're going to be building, or I'll show you uh, myself building, is what I'm just calling ch run. Uh, and so it's not as absurd as Bocker, but it's a little bit absurd because we're going to be using uh, the change root uh, system call to, to build a Docker runtime. Oh, and I just included, previously I was learning a different topic uh, about containers and I, I did something else absurd. Uh, and Eric Raymond, I don't know if anybody's familiar with him, but he sent me this email. Uh, you're clearly not a sane man, but who am I to talk? So I thought I'd just throw that in there <laughs> as some context for where we're going. Um, but this is what I'm going to build. So this is ch run. Uh, I can say ch run, run, redis, and then it's going to take uh, a redis image from Docker Hub and it's going to start it up. Uh, and then you can, you know, open up another window, you can start it up and connect to it. Uh, and, you know, it looks like any given Docker run type commands. I'm not doing any port binding or anything, but this is what I'll show you how to make. Um, but first, a little bit about me. So I, I used to work at this company called Tenable. They're a software security company. Um, Nessus Scanner, I think, is like their most famous product. But, but what I worked on was container security, and, and it was more properly um, OCI image security. And so we would scan images and see like what CVEs 
were in them, right? Is there like a remote execution problem in this image, uh, et cetera? I learned a lot of things there, right? Uh, I learned that people don't really worry about updating the various packages in their containers. They just send them out to prod and a big deal. Uh, not good. Um, but I also learned a lot about container images, OCI images, what the format looked like, pulling it apart, seeing what binaries are in there. Um, uh, but I didn't know a lot about what actually happens when you run a container, right? Like I, I did run them. You know, when I was doing development, I would start up a Redis image, I would start up a Postgres image, I had them all in a Docker Compose, and I would go against them. Um, and when I deployed things to production, you know, they would run in Kubernetes inside a container. But I didn't really know what that was. It's just like, it's a container. There it goes. Like, I, I don't know. I, the, the, the metaphor that always made sense to me was, you know, the shipping container. Like, I put, let's see if my pointer works. Like, the shipping container box. This is my understanding, right? It's a box. What is a container? It's a box. Okay. And that was enough, right? I never really had to know much beyond that. Uh, that was enough to get my job done. Um, and sometimes if I ask people more, I would get more meaningful messages, right? A container is not a VM. People were always very certain about that. Because it's, it's more lightweight and it shares user space. But, but really, it's sort of a VM. Like, this is kind of the story I would get, right? It's not really a VM. It's important you know it's not a VM. But it's sort of a VM. But that was enough, right? Until I got this new job, right? I was handing out these earthly stickers. Um, and, and so I work, I, I live in Canada, near Toronto. I work for my home office. I have, a, I have a standing desk. And I was sitting at it because I'm lazy. Uh, and um, yeah, I got this new job uh, at Earthly, and they had reached out to me because of all my knowledge of containers, but really, as I said, I knew more about images than containers, and I was looking into Earthly. Okay, it's an open source build tool, and it uses containers for build isolation. I thought, that's cool. And it's using Run C, which was our one on the, on the far left. Um, but then when you run it, it also runs inside of a container. Right? And this confused me. Like I was thinking, like, so if a container is a box, like this company is building software by putting boxes inside of boxes inside of boxes, like that doesn't make sense to me uh, what they're doing, right? Like it's containers inside containers inside containers. How is that like a, a thing that makes sense to do? Um, so that started me on this quest, right? The one that brought me all the way here to LA to tell you guys about it. Um, because I c it just didn't make sense in my mind. And I've learned, I, I don't know if it's a good trait or a bad trait, but like I have a certain understanding of how computers work and when somebody tells me something uh, that doesn't really make sense, uh, I kind of lean into that, like what's going on here? Like either my understanding is wrong or the world is wrong, or I've misunderstood something, and I, I kind of try to follow that and see where it leads me, right? So I'm sitting, this is supposed to be a picture of me sit, you know, sitting at my standing desk, eating my lunch at Earthly, trying to figure out, like, how does this work? Like, how are they building things faster by shoving boxes within boxes? It doesn't make sense. But so I find this talk by Jerome Pedizzoni. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and he worked at, at Docker in the, in the very early years when they were first like trying to tell people about this container idea, right? And everybody was saying a container was like a VM. And he gave this talk where he kind of got into the weeds and he said, okay, a container, it feels like a VM, but it's really just change root on steroids. It's just change root on steroids. Um, how you pronounce this, CH root, uh, seems to be a controversial topic, by the way. Uh, Anyone, how do you pronounce it? Anyone want to shout out? Yeah. <laughs> I, I just don't like that pronunciation, but you guys will have to put up with me just calling it change root. Um, anyways, so he has this talk. Uh, he says that it's change root on steroids. And what are the steroids? Well, the steroids are, are namespaces and C groups. Um, but this, you know, it's starting to make more sense to me that there's something here going on besides boxes, right? 
And so if you're familiar, the, the way that you change root is like this. Um, like here is my file structure, right? And I can call this command, I can pass it a new root, right? Which is, which is down here. Uh, and then pass it a process to run. And then it's gonna start up bin bash, but for bin bash, the root is gonna be here, right? So it's, it's changed the root, it's changed where that top level slash is to be inside that file structure. Um, so that, that makes sense, it's, it's a simple concept. Um, wasn't super clear to me how that made containers work, but I thought to myself, like, can I understand containers by understanding how that change root uh, command is implemented, right? Like, can I just dig in further? Um, so I've, I peeled back one layer, seen that this syscall is the answer to containers apparently, but let's peel back it more. Let's see, like, what does this syscall actually do? Um, I assume this is how everybody solves problems, but, but maybe not, because the next thing I did is downloaded the Linux source. <laughs> and when you download the current Linux source and you look for the syscall, um, it's a lot bigger than this. There's a lot going on in it, and like I knew immediately I was out of my depth. So I just used a trick of mine, which is just find an earlier version, right? Like code, you know, it gets more complex over time, it handles more edge conditions. So I went back and back until I found this, uh, the earliest version of Linux I could find, Linux uh, 0 0.01. And in the OpenC file, where it has all the file system stuff, uh, I found this implementation of the syscall. Um, yeah, and so it takes in a file path and then it makes sure it's a directory and then it changes the current route to that. I, okay, that kind of makes sense. It kind of made sense to me, Sim simple enough, but I don't know, I'm kind of kidding myself. I don't understand the Linux source that well. I think I need something even simpler. Um, and here's the thing, if, if this syscall was in the very first release of Linux, the, the 0 0.01, like where did it come from, right? Uh, we need to go back further, right? We need to go back to Unix. Because it turns out that this, this change route has been around for a long, long time. This is not uh, a new thing. And so following this idea, like I can understand it by finding the earliest implementation where it's very simple. And then I'll have a very simple understanding uh, both of how you change a route and how containers work. Um, so the first thing I did was I, I got this book that I have. Has anyone ever seen this book before? Yeah, we got one person, right? So this is uh, Lion's Commentary on Unix 6 Edition. I, I guess at some point this book was sort of illegal, right? There, like because it contains the source code for Unix version 6 and there was, there was lawsuits about it. And so on the cover you can see is a picture of people like illicitly photocopying it because you couldn't buy it. Uh, it needed to be photocopied because of all the, the copyright hangups. And it came from this guy, uh, John Lyons, who I believe it was a class he taught. These were like his class notes, but they couldn't be distributed. Uh, those lawsuits have been resolved. You can buy this on Amazon now. Um, so if you look through the book, it, it literally contains the, the source of, of Linux, or sorry, of, of Unix v6, and it has a nice index at the back, and I go to the index and I try to find the change root syscall, um, and it's not there. So I've gone too far. Uh, <laughs> can't go back, uh, um, can't go back quite that far. Um, but then I found, there's this guy, uh, Diamandis, uh, Spinelli, uh, he has a, a Unix history repo. And it, it starts with version one of Unix and it goes all the way up to today's like BSDs. Uh, and he created it synthetically. It's a, it's a Git repo where he put in all these commits as if they had all been working in one Git repo, um, you know, since the very first like PDP 11 uh, assembly uh, Unix version. Bet you didn't know your container uh, talk would be mentioning PDP assembly, but uh, sometimes I start going down these rabbit holes and I just keep going. Um, but yeah, I don't understand the Unix source well, but I understand Git, right? And so this is all a Git repo, and so I can just use some standard Git commands, and I can try to find the, the source of this change root command, right? And it looks like this. Now we're talking. Now it's like code I can understand, right? It's like very, it's doing very little. Um, and so th this is the commit you can see here. 
at the bottom. Um, so 1979, uh, May 7th, Ken Thompson, who, who's here somewhere, I believe, uh, committed this commit, uh, and he added both change dir and change root. Uh, change dir being CD, right? Like how you change one directory to another. It, it is very easy to understand this code. They both call this change directory command. One passes in uh, u underscore c dir, and one passes in u underscore r dir, right? So like what are those, right? Let's just keep following this thread, um, you know, at this point, I'm probably supposed to be actually doing something at my job, uh, <laughs> but I've gotten a little distracted, right? But so, uh, uder, the, the cder and arder are, are very easy to find, and especially since I, I downloaded this history and opened it up in, in VS Code and I could just click on them and, and pop up to, to where the file is. Um, don't judge me for using VS Code. But um, it, here's where they are, right? So there is a, a struct, which is just the current user. Um, and in that struct, there are these two values, right? One is the current directory, and one is the, the root directory. This is pretty simple. And so, like, this may not sound revelatory, but this kind of blew my mind. Like basically all of this container stuff you keep pulling on threads, really all it's doing is, is just changing this, this value, right, to a different spot. It's just setting a different mount point for this top level uh, of the file system. I mean, there's all kinds of other stuff going on, but when you pull back some of that complexity, uh, that's where you end up, right? Basically when you, you know, in that commit, there was both CD and changing the root and uh, you know, the one changes, you know, the CD changes everything up to the root, and then this one just lets you change where the root is to move it down to a different level. Simple enough, right? So we can use this. Um, basically, can we build our own Docker runtime just using this syscall, right? You could imagine, could we travel back in time to Unix v7 and build a container infrastructure using this syscall, right? So, so the simplest thing I can do with Docker is I can just do docker run hello world and it, it just prints out this message, right? And if you look inside of the image that that's running, uh, that image just contains a statically linked executable. Um, and so we can do the same thing just using the change root, right? We can make a test directory, we can copy in uh, our hello program, and then when we run that, we get the same message, hello from Docker. This is a very simple uh, container that runs our hello world, right? You might say, well, that's not a container, that's just a file system mount with the assembly in it that we're running. Well, guess what? Maybe that's what... <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's, let's move beyond um, that call, which is, you know, just that a binary somewhere in a bin directory that we're running, let's write our own, right? So I'm just gonna use go, um, and here, here's my code, right? I put together a command, um, I line up all my standard in and standard outs, and then I make the syscall uh, to change the root to my test root, and then I execute it, right? And so if I run that, now I'm running the Docker hello world. It's like the first step towards having a container runtime. We're starting up this thing in its own root. Um, now, of course, you can't see that we're in its own root because it's just like printing a message and returning, right? If we want to look around and see that, that we've actually successfully changed the file system root, we would want to like run bash inside there, um, which we can't, right? If I try to run bin bash inside there, it says no such file or directory. But that's actually true of Docker, right? We're, we're kind of matching ourselves bug for bug, the thing that doesn't work in Docker doesn't work in mine too, so I must be on the right track, right? <laughs> so the easiest way to fix that, if, you, if you're thinking naively, is I'll just copy in the shell, right? I'll copy in the shell into that root, and then I can run things. And so when I do that, and I run that, I still get no such file or directory, uh, whether using the built-in command or using my own chrun program. I get no such file or directory, which doesn't make any sense, uh, to me at least. There's somebody in here who understands why it's doing that, I'm sure. But um, 
that program is there. Why would it say no such file or directory? Um, and so, you know, I just start Googling things and I end up on Stack Overflow um, where they say like, oh, it's, it's saying that not about the shell that you're trying to run, but about the dynamically loaded libraries that aren't appearing there, right? So by slowly building things up like this, I'm starting to understand why we might need containers, right? Because when you look at how a binary works, there is this elf header, and in it, it can dynamically, it can point to dynamically loaded libraries. And if you run LDD on these, it'll return, you know, which ones are in the elf header. Um, and then you run LDD on those, and it'll tell you more, and it's kind of like a recursive process. Or if you want to fit it all on a slide, there is a program called LDD tree, and it will recursively walk all those and print them out. But this is the problem I'm having, right? When I run the shell, it tries to load this uh, LD slash Linux, which I believe is the loader, and then that tries to load libc. None of those exist because I've changed the root. Those paths don't exist. There's no, you know, slash lib, there's no slash lib 64. That's why uh, I'm not getting anywhere. Um, but maybe I can get away from this, you know, that's just a C problem, loading libc, maybe using go, I can try to get around that. So I build my ch run program, um, and going back to my container and container idea, what if I put my executable that puts things in containers and the inside of a container and then I run that, right? Will it work because it won't have any, uh, you know, dynamic dependencies that it loads in? And it doesn't, right? It get the same error, no such file or directory. And that's because um, unless you build things a special way, like you're still gonna be needing libc, right? And that's not inside my container. Um, so back to Google, I find the magic linker incantations for Go uh, to do a static build. And then I have a static version of my ch run program so it doesn't depend on having anything dynamically loaded. Uh, and once I do that, I can actually do containers within containers. Uh, they don't do a lot, but now uh, I'm running the ch root, and inside that I'm running my ch run, which is switching to that test root and calling that hello world. Uh, and I now have containers and containers. Not super useful, uh, but it exists. But like, at this point, I think I've learned something, right? It's, it's not really containers within containers. It's a, it's a file system tree and you're just taking a branch in that tree and saying this is the root for this new process, right? And then that process, you know, will still have a tree and be able to, I can take a branch of that and I can make that the root for a new process, right? So th there's not really nesting within nesting, it's, it's just a tree and every branch of a tree is itself a tree, right? Um, so this kind of helped things make more sense in, in my mind. Um, but it's not totally a, a usable um, solution, right? Right now I can only run a, a statically linked thing inside this container runtime. Um, this is sort of what run C does. You know, if I had set up all those lib uh, paths correctly, then I might be able to run sh inside there. Uh, but it's kind of a pain, right? I, I really want to be able to take something off the shelf like an OCI container that has everything already set up um, and run that. So let's do that next. Right, so uh, originally I was talking about Redis, right? Which is just like a, you know, a key value store in, in its simplest um, usage. And so if I, if I do this, Docker run Redis, or maybe you guys use Podman or, or whatever, Lima, Colima, there, there's a million different ways you can start up things now. But if I run Redis um, and I shell into it and I look around, right, I see like a full Linux file system, um, which I guess just everybody is used to being inside containers, but I guess the question is like why? Why is that all there? Why is there a full, you know, like Alpine Linux uh, inside of my Redis instance? And, and also, like, how can I run this myself with my ch run program, right? Well, one reason that full 
uh, Alpine Linux there is just because of all these dynamic links, right? If I take the Redis server and I, and I look at what it requires, it, it requires a, a lot of things. It has libc, but it also has SSL, it has crypto, it has pthreads, and so on and so forth, right? And then the way that the Docker image works, the Docker image that makes this is it starts with Alpine, um, and then it can use the Alpine package manager to pull in all these dependencies. And some of them that aren't easy to get, then it pulls them down from the web with wget or whatever, and then it runs this big kind of nasty find where it runs LDD on every Redis um, executable and marks them all as manually added so that the package manager won't clean them up. Basically, the, the Docker file is building up all this structure because Redis expects there to be a full Linux file system there and expects to be all these dependencies. Um, so that's why we want this full file system with all the important bits of Linux that we need, right? Mainly we need this just so that we can start this stuff up, right? Like it won't start up at all if it can't find its dynamic libraries. Um, but there's other reasons, right? There could be an expectation of loading config from a certain location. It could be writing logs to a certain location. Also like I shelled into this, right? And if I shell into it and I want to like cat a file or I want to tail something, like I actually need those inside there. Right? Because with the root change, it's not going to find them uh, you know, where I have them outside of that root. So there are other strategies uh, to changing to addressing this, right? Um, I saw a Nix booth in the expo thing. Uh, Nix is pretty cool. So if you, if you go to their website, they have this example where they don't have Node installed, right? Use my little pointer. They don't have Node installed. Um, and then they start a new Nix shell asking for Node, and then they're able to run Node. And like that seems like magic, right? And that's like you're not in a container, you're not in a box. Like you can still access your local file system. <laughs> and the re the re the way that works is they rewrite that elf header. So all the links of this Node.js is probably added to your path somewhere from the Nix store, and then all of the things that it needs have been modified in that header to point to specific locations. Uh, so basically it's like a whole bunch of sim links to make sure everything lines up correctly. So it's a whole different approach to the same sort of problem of how do we have everything in the places that we need it. But that's not my approach, right? I'm trying to learn about containers. I'm still telling my boss, like, no, I'm looking into it. I forget what I originally started on, but I'm, I'm off building this thing. Um, so what I need to do is be able to extract uh, a file system from an OCI image in order to be able to make my container runtime work, right? And so the easiest way to do that is just use Docker and save the image. You can just do Docker save, write it out as a tar, and then when you untar it, you, you get this, a whole bunch of folders with these giant pretty names, which is a SHA-256 hash. Um, and if you look at this layer dot tar in each one of them, this is what it is the hash of. If you generate the SHA-256 hash of that, that's the folder name. Um, and so that's how Docker builds up its union file system. Each of these is a layer and it puts them on top of each other. So I, I could basically make a loop, go through these, make sure I have them in the right order, and each of these layer.tars I extract in the right order over top of each other, each one corresponding basically to a run command in a, in a Docker file and then I would have the full file system. Um, and with that system, you know, I could probably run it uh, on something really old that you know, I couldn't even install Docker on. Um, but that, that sounds like a lot of work. So Docker has an export command that will take that layered tar and do all those steps for me. Um, so, and, and so I use that, right? Once I use that, um, I can extract the file system from any given OCI image, right? Whether it's on Docker Hub or whether it's on AWS or, or just when I'm running locally, I can take it and I can just extract to a folder the file system that's inside of it. And so I do that, right, with my Redis image and I can see it's the full Alpine uh, Linux install and then in uh, this bin folder, you can see all of the various Redis things that were installed. And so we're getting somewhere. This is useful. Right? In fact, if you squint, this is all I need to make a full kind of Docker um, 
container runtime, something like the Docker command line, but a bit simpler, right? I can take any image from a Docker hub and I can pull it down as a tar file, right? Then I just can just create a temporary directory and I can throw that in it, right? And then I can start up my new process inside of that and it looks the same as if you were to run it with Docker, right? And then once, you, um, once you're done, once you exit from that, then we just remove that temp directory. And so everything's ephemeral, right? Each time you start it up, you have a new file system. Any changes you make won't persist. Um, and you can just do this as much as you want. So let's do it. Let me grab some water. So this um, is my pull command, right? So to pull an image, this is, I'm just using docker export. And when I do that, that means for any given registry, I can pull down a tar. Uh, next thing I do is, is in my main method, I'm just gonna take an argument for whatever that image name is, right? Um, so my example, it is Redis. And then I'm gonna create a temporary directory. Um, when everything's done, I will remove it, and then I just have to untar things and then change root into it. And that's all we need. Specifically, um, if you use Docker uh, and you start up an image, it'll give it this nice name, like a uh, scientist name, funny quality, it'll be like fascinating Curie or something like that. Uh, what mine does is it takes the name of the tar and it strips out anything that's not alphanumeric characters, and then it just adds a bunch of you know, random characters on the end. Uh, not quite as nice, but very practical. Next thing I do is just untar that. Uh, just some simple untiring. Expand that into that temp directory, which I'm taking in uh, as the, is it the destination or the source? I forget. Anyways, uh, it extracts it. And then I have the change root, which I kind of showed before, right? I make a new command and I hook up all my standard in and standard out. Um, and then I run it, right? And then just to add some ergonomics to this, um, I'm gonna add a, a switch case. So I'm gonna say, if you run chrun, run, and then the name, we're gonna do all those steps we just went over. If you say pull, then we're gonna pull it down first, right? So basically what you get is something like this. We can do chrun pull redis, and we get that tire down from Docker Hub. Or, and then you can do chrun run redis, um, but we have to pass it. Pa we have to pass it what to run, right? But when we do that, we pass it bin uh, sh, and then we can look inside our container, and we can see it looks exactly the same as what we did with uh, Docker or Podman or etc. Um, the one thing that's different, right, is I have to tell it what to run. When you set up a Docker file, you can have an entry point and say, by default, if they don't say what to run, run this command. Uh, but here you have to pass that in. But it works, right? So you can do chrun run redis, and I'm going to pass it that redis server, and it starts up. And uh, yeah, so you can see each one gets a nice little name, which is the path that it stores it in. And there's my redis server, right? And then I can also... Uh, start up the Redis client, which will get extracted to a second location, and then they can start communicating with each other, right? I can do, um, you know, I'm setting a key, hello world, I get that key back, it's also hello world. Um, I can start up another client, and I can read that value back. As long as I keep that Redis server running, then any of the clients can set and get values. It's a container. It's a container runtime. Um, so this QR code takes you uh, to the code. Uh, it's a bit more in-depth than what we've covered here. Um, and uh, I have lots more to share. But whenever I share this, I feel like I should say, like, please don't use this. Like, <laughs> it's, not, it's not production ready. It's like, <laughs> because I say it's not production ready, people will use it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, here's, here's where the code is. You can play around with it. Um, you need to be uh, on Linux and, and you need to be root to, to actually run this command. Um, yeah. But to me, 
the important thing is not that we built it and it's like this small amount of Go code. It's like what it shows, right? Like a running container is just a process. It's just a process uh, running. It's not, it's not a VM at all, right? There's no VM there. Um, it's a process that has dynamic linking fixed, right? Like one way to think about it is like a container is like a hack for getting around all this dynamic linking problems by saying like, oh, we'll give you a full file system and set up everything inside this box exactly uh, how you need it. That's really what it is. There, there's no real, you know, sometimes people wonder about the overhead of running things in containers. Well, there's not really overhead because there's not really any there there. It's just, it's just a process, right? Um, but we're missing some stuff to, to make this like truly um, a true container runtime, right? Like there, if I put in a PR suggestion for Kubernetes to, to switch this as their container runtime, they're gonna have some objections, right? Not just my pronunciation of change root, but, but other things. Like we don't uh, use C groups or namespaces. So if I wanted to make this real, I would have to address that. Oh yeah, one, one tangent, right? This kind of answers my original question about Earthly and how it does like containers within containers and, and builds things faster, right? It's, it's not actually um, anything to do with boxes within boxes, right? It's, it's just file system trees and the way that it makes things faster um, is related to that. Uh, but th that's a talk for another time. I just thought I'd mention it. It did come full circle and it started to make sense to me what Earthly was doing. Um, but if we want to make this real, right, we have to change some things. Basically, we need to add some things. One of those things is namespaces. Um, so everything we covered so far, we're just using that one uh, syscall that's been in Unix since uh, 1979. You might wonder why is containers a, a new thing now, right? And part of the reason is, is namespaces, right? So namespaces are, are like what they sound like, like a namespace in a programming language. Um, you know, if I declare a variable X in some namespace in a Java program or a Go program, like I won't see it in another namespace, like they're isolated from each other. It's kind of the same idea, right? So there, there's a whole bunch of namespaces um, and they basically let you get a different view of a global resource. Looks like you kind of have it to yourself, right? So there is the network namespace, there is the mount namespace, like what mounts you can see. Uh, there's the PID namespace. So what I have so far, I didn't show it, but inside that Redis, if I was to run like PS, I would see all the processes on the, the host machine. I mean, because there only is a host, there's no VMs. But the, the reason that you don't when you use Docker is because of the PID namespace, which gives you different process IDs. Right, so when you're inside there, you, you see a different view of processes, you only see the processes inside that namespace. Um, same thing for user, right? Inside the user namespace, there's a different, uh, inside each namespace, there's a different uh, number of users, right? So it's a different view of that data. And so that is a big part of what gives this illusion of this is a VM. Right, because I'll see a different process list, I'll see different users. Even though I'm sharing the kernel and it's really just a process, it has a different view of things. Uh, there's also a namespace called UTS, which lets you set the host name. I'm not clear on why it's called UTS. I think it's Unix timeshare system, maybe. Um, yeah, so that lets you say that you're a whole different machine, right? Set a different host name. Um, continuing this illusion that, that you are in an isolated environment. The most important uh, namespace for containers is, is the C groups, right? You can set these all with unshare, by the way. Um, yeah, so C groups stand for control groups. Namespaces are all about what you can see, right? So they, they let you see, um, they basically isolate what you can see to provide this illusion of, of separation. Uh, control groups are all about control. But I should tell you that while I was doing all this, while I was on this, this uh, sidetrack, I, I found um, this great talk by Liz Rice, and she does a similar thing here. She builds her own uh, container runtime, and she focuses a lot on namespaces and how they work. And I stole this code from her, 
basically, if you add this code to the solution I have so far, we're going to be setting up um, some different namespaces. So we'll have a different host name. Uh, yeah, so different host name, different PID group. Um, yeah, I forget what the rest are. And um, yeah, her talk is great. If you want to know more about namespaces, I suggest you check it out. She also live codes the whole thing. Like while she's talking, she's typing it out. I saw that. I was like, that is amazing. That's how I want to get my talk. I tried it. <laughs> Turns out I can't like type and talk at the same time. It's not, not really a skill I have. Um, I'm no Liz Rice. But that's namespaces. Uh, the next thing we want to do to make it real is, is add the C groups, right? So the C groups, it's control. This is where you can limit things, right? You can take a process, any process, like this doesn't have to be a container, just any process, you can say, I would like this to use no more than 10 megabytes of memory. Um, and if you overcome that, then the kernel will kill it, right? And like I was a Scala developer before I started at Earthly and we had Kubernetes clusters and Scala uses a lot of memory and the kernel was always killing basically everything I wrote. So it became very familiar with this memory limit control group. Uh, but it's not just memory limits, right? You can set uh, IO limits, CPU limits, you can set process prioritization. And this is what's happening uh, if you do something like this, right? You do a Docker run and you set a memory overhead. This one is interesting um, because the way you actually set these values is interesting. Um, there is a CG create command but the way that people tend to use C groups is via this virtual file system. So you can basically write into this sysfs C group uh, and you write files and that's how you communicate with the kernel that you'd like to change things. Um, and so this code is again stolen from Liz Rice. You can tell because it says Liz uh, <laughs> down here. But, but what she did in her container runtime is she set a limit uh, using the PID's max limit here to say like, uh, in my namespace, I want there to be at most 20 processes, right? And so once she set that up, then she created a bunch of processes, and once you create the 21st, then the kernel steps in and kills it. Um, and so that's control groups. Control groups let you control processes. But yeah, like the interesting thing that I feel like I have to reiterate, because it's a surprising thing to me, is like none of these things are really container things, right? People took these various things that Linux offers, took these three ideas of, of having a different route, uh, you know, being able to control things, having a different view of things. Um, but you can do this on any given process. You can set these limits. You can set a new namespace. Um, the other thing you might want to do to make it real is instead of using change root to use pivot root, uh, it's possible to escape from the changed root if you somehow are able to you know, get a hold of something that's out, you could change back out, I guess. Um, although maybe you shouldn't really be using uh, containers as a security uh, abstraction anyways. But real container runtimes use pivot root. The other problem uh, with what I've shown you so far is it could be a little bit slow, right? That hello world example is fine. It's just a hello uh, executable and it's gonna be fast to start up, we just like extract it. But if we have a full, you know, heavy install with just like a million packages, and like I've seen containers that are, that are like four gigabytes in size, like each time you run it, extracting that and then starting it up and then destroying it at the end is gonna be expensive. And also, if you have a whole bunch of containers and they're all based on a certain Alpine Linux version, um, and you pull them all down as tars like this, you're re-pulling that whole base install every time, right? And so that's why the OCI image format has layers and it separates these out into immutable layers so that that base install of Alpine uh, could be one single uh, layer and it could be shared among those various images, right? And then they use a union file system when actually running things so that instead of untiring everything and then destroying it at the end, you could just immediately immutably, having trouble with this word, uh, mount them all on top of each other, and then uh, you know there's only changes made to the top level uh, of this union file system. So that would be one way, it's kind of like an optimization to, to make what we've made uh, more performant, less uh, network traffic going on, and um, less to destroy each time. 
Which brings me all the way back around, right, to this talk. Because uh, when I first watched the talk, it didn't all make sense to me. But by the time I kind of built everything myself and I watched it, it made a lot of sense. Because what Jerome said was, a container feels like... That's it. Uh, and so, like, to me, this explains a lot, right? Like, it, there's a lot of questions sometimes I hear get asked about containers, right? Like, if you're using Docker machine on a Mac, like I am here, like, sometimes it's, it's really slow or it takes up a lot of space and people complain. And, like, why is that? Um, well, first of all, if you're running it on a Mac, it's just running a VM of Linux and then doing all this stuff inside because those syscalls, they don't all exist on a Mac, right? Um, but what's the runtime overhead? Uh, of being in a container, well, it's, it's nothing. It's just a process, right? Why are containers slow on, on Mac or on Windows? I mean, sometimes it's because that VM, you just need to give it more memory. Like, they kind of hide away the fact that there's this VM, but it is there, and if it's under-resourced, then that's going to be a problem. Um, like, how can I make my image start faster? Well, probably, if your image was just a statically linked executable, like, there would be no overhead at all, right? Like, if you think it's running slower, it's probably running slower pulling all this stuff down or, or maybe mounting something. Um, maybe, you know, it's more about the image that you've created than about anything to do with how containers work at runtime. Or if you're mounting, you're like file sharing. Like, I share a folder on my MacBook into this container I'm running, and it's really slow. Well, it's nothing to do with containers, why that's slow exactly. It's because I'm running a VM onside my machine, like inside my machine, and I'm somehow getting those files across. And you can choose different ways to get them across, but it's, none of it's very different than like SSH or rsync across from one machine to the other, and that just takes time, right? There's nothing innate to containers. It's just life. I don't know. It's just how things work. So uh, that's my talk. Uh, I have some more I could share, but I'd like to... Uh, let anybody ask me questions. If you've got a question, please raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. So your demo mostly focused on like a file system. Uh, but with namespaces, you have uh, obviously different types of isolations for network uh, processes. For on the file system site, you went down kind of a, a hole of kind of figuring out what that was, and you ended up using a, well, with the Shroot utility specifically. Is there something equivalent, for example, with uh, isolating processes? Is that something you can point back to, like a single Unix utility, or is that just specifically uh, kernel technology? Yeah, well, it, like, uh, where's my slider? That's a great question. I, I think I'm supposed to repeat the question. So the, the question is, like, um, you know, if you think of containers as being these three things, like the, the file system root changing and the namespaces and the C groups, what's the equivalent uh, for namespaces? And it's just this, uh, just this clone call. So the clone call lets you set up namespaces. I mean, it's much newer. You, you can't find it in Lion's commentary on Unix. But, but that's the equivalent way uh, of playing around, It'd just be calling that directly uh, at the terminal. An uh, interesting thing uh, you made me think of, right, is you might have noticed when I started up Redis um, and then I started up the client, I could, they could talk to each other and I didn't do any port you know, mapping or anything like that. Well, that's because of the network namespace. Like, I didn't set up a, setwork, a separate network namespace, and that's why they could all talk to each other, which for local development is actually, frankly, nicer. And I think that Podman uh, might actually follow the sort of idea of, of sharing the, like, not going in a new network namespace. Interesting tangent. Hi. Um, so I have a question about the the rationale for C group namespaces. So you can use C groups without a C group namespace, right? Like you don't really need a, a C group namespace. You can create C groups for each container before you start each of them. Um, and then set the resource limits and whatever from from the from outside the container. So I'm trying to understand, I guess, why, why is it needed and 
why is cgroup namespace needed? Uh, that, yeah, I'm not sure. Like, I, I think that the, the, you know, the, I'm not sure. I don't want to speculate because I'm sure that I'll be wrong. <laughs> hey, thank you. Well, this is kind of working, I guess. Uh, so, uh, first off, I think there are two Liz Rice talks. Now, there's a shorter one, and then I think a year later she gave a longer one. And so, just there's a longer one and a shorter one, so people know if they're going to look at that at some point. Great talks. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and but my question is, uh, there's a bunch of container runtimes. Uh, why did Earthly want to build their own? Like, what's what what are the different dimensions of different container runtimes, and why would they go ahead and make a whole different one for themselves? Oh, it's a good question. So so Earthly um, doesn't right. So Earthly uses a build kit, and the, the you know it's we're a small team at Earthly, but we're pretty heavy contributors to BuildKit. BuildKit is uh, what builds your Docker file. If you know you, you take a Docker file, turn it into an image. Um, it's an open source, like it's a project that came out of Docker, was open sourced under Mobi. Um, and so it uses Run C, which is sort of the, the lower level container runtime. So we didn't build our own. Um, what we're doing is taking this kind of, Docker files are great at preventing rework. If, if you've, um, run a command before, it will cache it. Um, and so we're using that for builds, like basically an alternative to like Bazel, where we're saying like, oh, you don't need to rerun these tests because nothing changed in this directory. Uh, but we are not building our own container runtime, just, just using one. By the way, uh, I have a bunch of earthly stickers. I handed out some uh, earlier, but if anyone would like one, uh, please come up at the end of the talk or whatever. Uh, hi, Adam. Uh, I have a question regarding your uh, scope of the containers you're discussing. Uh, are these concepts only applying for application containers, not for system containers? Because uh, uh, I think like LXD, LXD, they are system containers, but they are virtualizing the full operating systems on top of the like their kernel. But the Docker's, et cetera, are uh, application containers, right? So I think the question is about LXD, yeah, like yeah. the, the container-y thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's just a different presentation of these same things, right? It's using the same syscalls. It just kind of has a different abstraction. It's not using OCI containers. Uh, so it, you can see, I mean, I'm no expert on LXD, but I think that if you were to look at how it worked, you could map it onto these concepts of namespaces and C groups and uh, file system mounts. Okay, thanks. I believe that they are mounting the union file system, um, but I have an interesting, I have a slide about a related topic. Uh, should I answer you or go to the next one? So <laughs> there, there is a, something really cool. It is called uh, star GZ, which is just a seekable tar. So it's a, the, the problem with a tar file is, you know, you need to extract everything from it to see what's in it. So the seekable tar has sort of like an index, so you can see what's inside of it. Um, and so it, it came out of Google, and the, the insight there was when you pull down a container, right? I pulled down this Redis container, and has to suck down this whole Alpine system and untar it, all these union things and start them up, but it's just gonna run that, that Redis server and then maybe some dynamic links. So they made like a lazy loaded file system. So when you go to start up the image and you go to start up that, that Redis thing, it, like the file system says like, oh yeah, that's here. 
but then it holds that and goes and gets that specific file and then turns that over and then basically it can start up without downloading all the stuff. Like it, it basically, as you ask for each file, it's gonna retrieve them from the registry. And, and so this is a graph, right, showing that if you were to use star GZ and Kubernetes, like you get these low startup times for images you haven't seen because it's able to start them in most cases before it pulls down the full image. Like it'll pull them down in the background, but it'll just grab the specific executables. So that's like a really neat file system implementation to, to speed up container starts. Hi, I was just wondering if the uh, modern change root source makes any more sense now, if you've gone back to look at it now, that, or if it's still too complicated even knowing all this. Yeah, I haven't gone back to it, but uh, if it doesn't make sense, it's probably more to do about the fact that I don't really understand uh, how to implement an operating system. Uh, you know, I'm sure that everything that's in there uh, makes a lot of sense if you're Linus or whoever's working on it. But um, this book, uh, I would recommend. I haven't gotten very far into it, but it does have like a like the the the, the Unix six edition that's in here is like eight thousand lines of code, uh, I believe. And then there's like an explanation that at the back that kind of explains what things are. Um, theoretically, is very understandable. I, I didn't get that far, but I've been told if I invest some more time in this, it'll all. Uh, this is Lyons commentary on Unix six edition. Okay, I think we've, uh, we're approaching the end of our time slot here. I want to remind everybody, and it seems like if you're in this room, you'd be interested in the keynote speaker, which is Ken Thompson, starting in 30 minutes right around the corner in the combined big ballrooms. Uh, also, um, if you, like me, thought this was a great talk, why don't you join me in giving a round of applause for Adam? Adam.